Hello, and welcome to National Book Foundation's Book Up at Home monthly author visit series. My name is Andy Donnelly, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. I'm excited to welcome you to another installment of the 2021 Book Up at Home program. Our mission at the National Book Foundation is to connect people with books. Often that means connecting young people with authors and teaching artists in a book club setting. This year, it also means offering these virtual spaces for young people to connect with authors and ask questions about writing and reading. Thank you to our Book Up partners for connecting students with these virtual events. And thank you to our funders at the National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, and New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We're thrilled to be joined today by writer, illustrator, and graphic novelist, Jarrett J. Krozowska. Jarrett is the author of more than 30 books for young people, including several picture books, select volumes of Star Wars Jedi Academy, the Lunch Lady graphic novels, and the Pla Platypus Police Squad novel series. He is a New York Times bestselling author and a two-time winner of the Children's Choice Book Award. He is also the host of The Book Report with JJK on Kids Place Live on Sirius XM. He grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and now lives in Western Mass with his wife and children. His graphic novel, Hey Kiddo, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Students in the Book Up program have received copies of Hey Kiddo, which they've been reading this month, and they're tuning in with questions for Jarrett. If you have a question, you can enter that question in the Q&A feature below at any point during the talk. With that, I'm excited to turn things over to Jarrett for a brief presentation. For having me today. Thank you for all that every, everyone is doing over there at the National Book Foundation during these times. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, thank you. So uh, welcome to my art studio. I'm here in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I think that is one of the major silver linings of uh, you know switching from in-person author events to virtual events because uh, we can connect, but we can also connect when I'm here in my space and I can share some of my items with you. You know, I, I'm going to share artwork with you. I'm going to share sketches. And uh, before I before I do any of that, I really would like to start by talking about how I became a reader myself. And I have an overhead camera here and I'm going to swap my view. So you can see my number one favorite book as a kid was Beverly Cleary's The Mouse and the Motorcycle. I love this book so much as a kid. I still have my childhood copy. And when you open up the book, you see that I put my name in it. And uh, the mouse and the motorcycle and Bonicula and James and the Giant Peach, these were all of my favorite books to read. Uh, but these were also the only thing that was considered reading when I was a kid. And so I didn't think I was an avid reader until I became an adult and I realized I was reading all the time. It's just that the reading material I was into was not uh, justified as real reading. Uh, by the adults in my life when I was a kid. So I was obsessed with Snoopy. I was obsessed with Batman. I would collect the Batman comics every month. Garfield and Calvin and Hobbes. And so these are all of my childhood copies. These are the books that I read as a kid. And I keep them here in my art studio just to remind me where I came from, to remind me how I get to be doing what I'm doing. And and, and so when I'm writing books, I'm, I'm chasing the thrill that I received as a kid when I read these. You know, I, I, I want to be able to have readers feel a, a similar way to my, to my books. And so, so, so that's really, those, are, those have been my North Star in everything that I do. Now, uh, before Hey Kiddo, I was mostly known for younger books. You mentioned um, the Lunch Lady books. Uh, before before Hey Kiddo was published, I was probably most known uh, for the the Lunch Lady graphic novel series, uh, which is a very lighthearted uh, take on and a very goofy story about a lunch lady who fights crime. Um, but I'm here because I branched out to write a much more intense story, and that is my own personal story with with Hey Kiddo, uh, and uh, this was a long journey. This actually connects to the very first book that I ever had published. The very first book that I ever had published was published in 2001. And it was called, it's still called, uh, Goodnight Monkey Boy. This is the first book, it's a picture book, 
very thin, a, a very simple story about a kid who doesn't want to go to bed. And, and when I had this book published and when I got to see my name on the spine for the first time, I, uh, I thought, well, here's the happy ending for this kid who, who loved to draw, but he was surrounded by all of this trauma. Uh, you know, I, I was raised by my grandparents uh, because my birth mother uh, had an addiction to heroin and she wasn't able to give me the physical care that I needed as a baby. And my grandparents raised me uh, and they certainly had their, they battled their demons as well. Uh, and so when I had that first book published in 2001, I thought, well, that was the happy ending for that, for that kid. Uh, but every time I sat down to write what would become Hey Kiddo, what would be, I would, every time I sat down to write a memoir, a story about my own upbringing, I would stop and I would hesitate out of fear, fear of what people might think. I'm not the readers, but the people that are featured in the book, because it certainly is a tricky thing to write about your real life and real people. And I, I, every time I found myself stopping and hesitating, I realized that I wasn't emotionally ready just yet to write this book. And so I would continue to go back and flirt with the idea of writing a book about my own life while I was working on other books. Like, uh, like I, so these are all of my picture books, like like Punk Farm, like the Lunch Lady graphic novels, like the Jedi Academy books. Again, very different subject matter than writing a true story about having been uh, de dealing with family addictions. And so this is what happened. This was the big switch for me. This was the big change in which I, I became ready to write this book. It was 2012. So from 2001 to 2012, it was it was in, in um, no October October of 2012. It was a Friday afternoon, and my phone rang, and it was a producer at the TEDx talks at Hampshire College, and they informed me that their headliner had quit, and was wonder they were wondering if I could fill in and deliver a TED talk, and and it was I was excited by that prospect, but I thought they meant it would be next week the week after, I mean, how last minute are we talking? Well, they were talking about that evening. They were talking within four hours. And so I committed to it and I immediately wondered, well, what in the heck am I going to talk about? I, you know, and so it was Gina, who's my wife, who said, you know, you should talk about your childhood and, and you should get up there and, and just, just tell your story. You won't need notes to tell your life story. And uh, through her advice, I, I went up and for the first time publicly, talked about my mother's addiction to heroin, talked about how that affected my life. I talked about how I used art to save me and to buoy me. I talked about the, the, all the different teachers I had that were lifelines over the years. And all I knew was this would go on the TEDx YouTube page and, you know, maybe it would get a couple hundred views. Uh, it, you know, TEDx is different from TED.com. TED.com is like, is like the mothership. It's like the, the main one. TEDx is something where communities can, can host these events and they go on the TEDx YouTube page and they don't typically always get a lot of views. Uh, well, my video did. My video was suddenly received thousands upon thousands of views and that got the attention of the TED.com, the main group. And then it became a TED talk of the day. And now it's been viewed more than a million times. And so what happened was after I would visit schools, after that TED talk, I'd visit schools and it wouldn't matter where I was, I would meet a young person who was also dealing with uh, some sort of similar uh, affliction. They had a, a parent who was incarcerated. They had a parent who was dealing with addictions. They were being raised by a, a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt. And it wouldn't matter where I was. Uh, it wouldn't matter if I was uh, in a private school or public school, an area that was suburban, urban, or rural every single school I walked into, I would meet a young person who was dealing with a similar set of circumstances. So there is the switch where I said, well, I always thought that maybe I might want to write a book about growing up. I switched that to, I feel the responsibility to write a book about growing up as it did because I live this experience. I know these emotions and I'm able to deliver the story in a very unique way as a graphic novel. So I got over the hurdle of writing and telling the stories of these people, but now comes the next hurdle, which is how do I 
draw these people? How do I draw myself as a character in a book? And the thing about uh, creating a character for a book is that you have to give that character a very unique look, right? And that, that stays consistent so people can recognize them. Now, even though, you know, over the years, I'm, you know, I, I would have different haircuts. My grandparents would have different haircuts. I would have to, I had to settle on the look that I would, I would be consistent with. So for me, that was choosing the version of me when I was a teenager, where my, my hair was parted down the middle. Uh, with my grandparents, it was, a, my grandfather would always wear these, these big glasses that turned to sunglasses when he went out into the sun. They both had prescription glasses. And it was very, actually very comforting because my grandparents had since passed. It was very comforting to spend time with these people again that I loved dearly uh, who are, were then deceased. And there's something about a graphic novel that really makes you feel as though you're right in the room where the action is taking place. And for me, it was definitely a, a different emotional journey because I was then, I had to be face to face with these, uh, these people again and with these events again. And there were some times in which, you know, it was very traumatic to relive these traumatic events. Uh, so one thing that was very helpful was, was being in active talk therapy while I was writing the book uh, and then promoting the book, which is a whole other thing, which uh, that now having to sort of relive it over and over again as the, the different books tour stops. And there were times in which, you know, I would feel like I was no longer in my art studio, but back in the kitchen that I, of my childhood home that I grew up in. And I did a significant amount of research when, when I wrote this book, which we might think is odd because, you know, I lived the story. I know the story because I lived it. Um, but the story is also taking place when I was a kid in the 1980s and the 1990s. And so I had to get a lot of photo reference for places and what places look like in, those, in that era. Uh, I also, as the author, I'm always trying to figure out what the motivations of my characters are. And now the tricky part is, you know, my characters are real human beings that are alive or some that were alive. And so I went on a deep dive into my family history and interviewing family members and also um, reading documents, reading letters. And as the author, I'm on the side of my protagonist, right? So if I'm writing a book about a little kid who doesn't want to nap, well, I, I don't want to come at it from the, the parent's perspective that says naps are important. So the main character in this book is me at 16. So one of the things that I did was these are all of my sketchbooks, not all of them. This is a, a bunch of the sketchbooks that I kept as a teenager. And I went through these sketchbooks as an adult and was really confronted with, you know, who I was then and what I was going through then. And, and as an adult, when I, when I look through these sketchbooks, I do see a lot of the pain and frustrations that I was dealing with as a teenager. And these sketches that I made at 15, 16 years old just brought me right back to where I was. There's almost something more powerful about seeing your inner thoughts through sketches than seeing an old photograph of yourself. And so this was incredibly helpful and resourceful for me when I then went to write Hey Kiddo. And when I write my graphic literature, I write my graphic literature as a script, much in the same way one would write a script for a TV show or a movie. And this is the script that I wrote, what would become the final draft of the script for Hey Kiddo. So when one is writing a script, 
you are calling out uh, the environment. So here it says exterior graveyard day in all capitals. And that establishes where we are. This is stage direction. It reads, Joe is teaching Jarrett how to drive a car. They are in Joe's boat of a Cadillac. Joe is driving and pulls the car to a stop. And then when your character has dialogue, you put the character's name in all capitals and you center it. And then you center their dialogue. So it's visually, the dialogue is visually different than what you're seeing in the stage direction. Joe, come on, get behind the wheel. Back to stage directions. Joe and Jarrett get out of the car, switch sides. Joe takes a drag from his cigarette. Joe continued. Now step on the brake. Ease into drive. All right, good. Now slowly take your foot off the brake. Jarrett lets off the brake, but then quickly brakes again at the sensation of the car moving forward. Joe continued. Jeepers crow. Jarrett, sorry. It's okay. You know why I'm teaching you how to drive in a cemetery, right? Joe and Jarrett, because everybody is already dead. Jarrett. Yeah, you've mentioned that. Back to stage direction. Joe cracks himself up. Scenes of Jarrett driving and Joe smoking as they navigate the paths of Hope Cemetery. Narrator. I can't wait to get my license. Won't need to worry about getting a ride from anyone. Krampa has trouble seeing at night with all the headlights coming at him, so he's never able to drive me anywhere. Grandma only drives me when she absolutely has to, so like doctor's appointments and, and that sort of stuff. Now... This is the script for Hey Kiddo. This is all of the scripting and writing that went into a 320 page graphic novel. And as a script, it comes in at about 120 pages. Now in the world of TV and film, one page of script equals one minute of time on the screen. It doesn't quite work out like that for the graphic novel, because of course, next I have to then show that after that, after that script is approved by the publisher, I have to show the publisher what my visualizations will be. Now, because I know my readers are going to be reading my text from left to right, I want to have all of the visual action moving from left to right so that the flow of the visuals is in tandem with the flow of the reader's gaze. So it's very purposeful that these characters are moving from left to right. Come on, get behind the wheel. Click. Now step on the brake. Ease into drive. All right, good. Now slowly take your foot out the screech. Jeepers, crow. Sorry. It's okay. You know why I'm teaching you how to drive in a cemetery, right? Because everybody is already dead. Yeah, you've mentioned that. Can't wait to get my license. Won't need to worry about getting a ride from anyone. Grandpa has trouble seeing at night with all of the headlights coming at him, so he's never able to drive me anywhere. Grandma only drives me when she absolutely has to, so like doctor's appointments and that sort of stuff. Now, this is all of the sketching that went into Hey Kiddo. Now, whereas I have an editor who helps me with the story, and the editor helps make sure that the story is just where it needs to be, and... Um, we work on the language and, and the word choice. The art director is helping me with the visuals. So if anything is not clear, they're going to talk me through uh, how to improve that, how to, how to effectively tell my stories with the visuals. Now, words and pictures are teammates. And so you want them to work together. You don't want them to, um, you, you don't want them to repeat one another. So you allow the words and the pictures to each tell a part of the story. And I'm going to use one of my picture books to show you uh, a very simple and effective way in which I do that. This is Punk Farm. And I treat the front matter of a book like the opening sequence for a movie. So front matter is title page, copyright page, dedication page. And so I'm introducing you to the environment and the setting with all of that. So here in Punk Farm, you are meeting the characters. 
You're getting a bit of the aesthetics of their world. And in this illustration, we see a farm. We see a farmer pushing a wheelbarrow. We see him walking from his house. He has a truck that is red and his barn is red. It's a nice day. And we turn the page to see this scene. Now, the first line of this story is Farmer Joe works hard all day long. Now, in that first sentence, I did not have to tell you Farmer Joe lived in a white house and had a red barn and it was a sunny day with the sun setting in the background. And Farmer Joe had a cow, a sheep, a chicken, a, a pig and a goat. I did not have to tell you any of that in the text because I have told you that in the pictures. So if you're seeing the details in the pictures, you do not need those exact same details in the text. You want the words and pictures to complement one another. Here are some of the finished pages of the original artwork from Hey Kiddo. And I create my artwork at a much larger scale than what it will eventually be printed at. It's about twice the size of what the book will be printed at eventually. And after, let me take out the sketch. Let me see if I can find the sketch for this page. So after the story is approved and after the sketches are approved, I can move on to the final line work. So here is this, this is my eighth grade graduation scene. Once that's approved, this would get blown up, placed on a light box. So I could see the sketch I'd place this paper above the sketch and I can see the sketch through the paper and then I create the finished line work. And this is ink on paper, ink dipped into a brush. I typically draw all of my comics with a brush that looks something like this, that's dipped into ink and then applied to the paper. Now it's typical for a graphic novelist to hire somebody to help you shade the work, but I didn't want anyone else's hands on this but mine, since it's such a personal story. It's also very typical uh, for one to use a digital media to colorize the work. But I did want to have as much tactile information. I, I want to use as many tactile uh, media as possible so that it, it felt a little gritty. I wanted it to fit the theme of the book. And so what I would do, one, I didn't hire uh, a, 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 someone to help color and shade. I did it all on my own because of the personal nature of the book. So on a separate piece of paper, I would then place it on a light box and I would apply these grayscales. This allowed me to do a few things. It allowed me to really get into the emotion of the piece because I allowed myself to really feel things as I was going in and applying uh, that the, all of those gray skills, I uh, will show you how I combined those two and what the final result was. Um, one piece that I'm that I, from the onset that I really wanted to focus on is I didn't want there to be any borders. I didn't want there to be borders around the word balloons or the panels. Like a memory, I wanted it to flow to one into one another. So this physical artwork, these two pieces of physical artwork would get scanned in, opened in Photoshop to create this finished page. And I, I'll show you in a moment how I use digital brushes that recreate the look of chalk and watercolor to put in the signature colors. Now, obviously there are plenty of times in which I make mistakes. I can choose to fix those mistakes a few ways. For instance, here, I was really happy with the way these two figures were drawn. However, their feet didn't match up. So I made a note in the art, a little arrow, a little symbol, so that when I went to scan that artwork in, I would know in Photoshop to adjust the art in such a way that their feet were on the same plane. But whenever I can, I do try, want to try to fix the mistakes here. And I, if I have ink in a place I don't want it to, I'm not sure if it'll, I'm not sure if it'll play over video, but I use whiteout. 
So there's some whiteout applied here. There's some whiteout applied here. There's some whiteout applied here. Now, the one thing that's fascinating about whiteout, one, I'm amazed that they still make it. They still produce it. Um, but if, if to see a, a gallery exhibit, an art exhibit, of old comic work, what's going to happen over the years is this paper will age and it'll get yellow and it'll get gray, but that whiteout will remain stark white. So I'm going to now show you um, on my iPad how I break down the files. So I'm typically using um, Photoshop on a very big uh, computer called the Surface Studio in which I can uh, manipulate everything right on the screen. And it's about the size of the desk that I'm on right now. But once I have the sketch and I place the sketch where it needs to go, and I have these different layers hidden, but I'm going to reveal them to show you the order in which I go. I'd get the text all placed in to see how it's all, all fitting together. And then I would bring in the black line work. And I would make sure that that was fitting over the the sketches in such a way that was close to where it was now i'm going to hide the sketching and i'm going to bring in the grayscales and this is again where i can move things around but i want to make it feel like one big cohesive piece And then I would put in the digital colors. I'll add some white, the signature orange color. And that orange was chosen because it is, um, my grandfather had a, a lot of pocket squares. And after his passing, I just couldn't get myself to, to, to give away those pocket squares. Uh, and so we kept them and my, my eldest then used it as a security blanket. Uh, the colors for the panels and the word balloons. And, and so that is all of the work that went into every single uh, page for Hey Kiddo. And I'm currently working on a follow-up to Hey Kiddo. It's called Sunshine. And it actually all takes place within the timeline of Hey Kiddo. So this was originally going to be a chapter in Hey Kiddo about my time working at a camp for kids uh, with critical illnesses. And it just didn't fit into the narrative of the story and plotline of Hey Kiddo. So that chapter became just this one page in Hey Kiddo. And now this entire story is going to be the entire next book. It's called Sunshine, How One Camp Taught Me About Life, Death, and Hope. And you'll be able to read Hey Kiddo up to this page. Stop. Read uh, the entirety of Sunshine, which comes in at about 240 pages. And then read the rest of Hey Kiddo. So whereas Sunshine was supposed to be released uh, in 2000. Uh, the pandemic was a, a brutal time for productivity for me um, with I have three kids that were learning from home uh, and to be in a, a good creative space. I need to be in a good mental space, too. And the past year has been filled with a lot of anger, frustration, fear, uh, not very conducive to being creative. Uh, also, I had to stop myself and realize that I was writing about past trauma while living through new trauma. And so I just needed more time to finish the book. So Sunshine will be released now in the spring of. Uh, and I'm really happy that I was able to give myself the more time. And my publisher was was so was so flexible with with all of that. Um, so. So, yeah. So 
I would love to know if there were questions that came in. And I know those questions are going to lead to me wanting to show you more stuff here, uh, either either digitally or some of the so the artwork I have around me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Th thank you so much for for everything there. That was so cool to see. So cool to see the drawings as they happen. And uh, I definitely didn't realize that you had scripted it out as a screenplay uh, beforehand that that went into it. So that was really cool to see all of that. We definitely have some questions that came in. Um, awesome. a, a lot of questions about Hey Kiddo that some of our book up students have been reading and, and questions about the talk. I'll start with a question from Casper. Um, who wants to know how you learn to draw so well? What's what has been your practice in life to to be such a master of uh, of of your artwork? Well, uh, Casper, thanks for thinking I'm I'm any good at drawing. I mean, it really comes from years and years of practice. You know, I've been an artist for as long as I can remember. Uh, asking me when I started drawing would be like asking one when did they start eating or breathing. It's just always been there. And so one of the ways that I really learned how to draw as a young person was to copy the artwork I would see in my favorite books. So I would draw Batman, I would draw Garfield. And also I was able to include a lot of that artwork in Hey Kiddo. Whenever you see the Jared character draw, you see the artwork that I made at that age. And I went to, uh, I continued my education on the college level, pursued a degree in bachelor's of fine arts and illustration. But most importantly, I just, it's just a constant journey. Like, and I'm still constantly learning how to draw and how to write and how to bring words and pictures together. One thing that I'm very thankful for is that I didn't write Hey Kiddo back in 2001. Because between 2001 and 2016, when I started getting into the final art for the book, I had learned so much in that decade and a half that really benefited the book. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth in our book up class who wants to know why you decided to open Hey Kiddo in a cemetery. Why, why that setting? Well, I mean, one uh, is that my grandfather taught me how to drive in a cemetery. Like he taught all of his, his kids how to drive and, and getting that license was foreshadowing what was to come later. What was, what was to come with, with, the Jarrett character, me getting my license and, and looking for my father. Now, uh, the opening scene of any story, uh, you, you really want to try to hook the reader. So I wanted to establish that the narrator was the teenage version of me before I got back into the story about my, my early childhood moments. Um, and so I guess because I, I, I learned how to drive in a cemetery as well, like, I guess that never struck me as odd so much as that, uh, you know, now that the book's out there, like, well, why did you start that in a cemetery? Cause that's so, that's a pretty dark thing. But it, the idea of learning how to drive in a cemetery it, it is, is, is a little bit off center. And so I knew that that could also help hook the reader and get them interested, like saying, what the heck is this story about? Um, but it does also foreshadow what, what's going through my character's head when it, in terms of, um, you know, uh, the, the inevitable death of loved ones and especially grow, growing up, you know, being raised by my grandparents by a generation that that generation removed, that was something that always hovered, wondering how long they would live into into my my adult life. It obviously also sets up the colors for for the for the whole book. Did you at what point in deciding to to write your life story as a graphic novel at what point did you settle on this that color scheme the grayscale that you that you showed us well a big part of it was in wanting to make sure it visually separated itself from younger graphic memoir so graphic memoir is incredibly popular uh, with middle grade you know uh, you know ages ages 7 to 11 and this is a much heavier story and because i was known for, for work that's for younger readers. There was a lot of assumptions uh, from librarians and booksellers that my memoir would be 
for younger readers. Uh, and so there's this thing uh, in publishing and in film called the elevator pitch. And it's called the elevator pitch, meaning you you have time in an elevator with someone who can make your project. You need to have just one sentence to help explain what your story is. And my, my publicist at the publisher was getting so frustrated by me because of, because of my elevator pitch to the general public to help them understand what this book was. And my elevator pitch was, it's like smile, but with heroin. And of course, you know, Raina Telgemeier's smile is a graphic memoir. Uh, and no one was expecting me to say, but with heroin. But it, it's a quick and easy way to help explain and convey what this was, that this is an intense story and, and don't give it to, don't automatically give it to young kids unless they really need it. Yeah, thank you. And so in regards, so, so, so the, the color was to, was, was to separate it from that. And, um, you know, it allow, allows you to just uh, be in the story in a, in a slightly different way. And maybe someday we'll do it a 20th anniversary, like full color edition or something, but we've got a ways. Oh, oh, I've got plenty more books to write before I would spend all that time painting all those pictures. Let me just remind folks tuning in that you can use the Q and A feature at the bottom. Uh, type in a question; it'll get sent to me, and I'll ask it of Jared. So, if you have any questions, make sure to type them in in the Q and A section. We have a question and a comment from Skyla. The comment is that she loves the the old school typewriter behind you. Uh, she's marveling <laughs> at the at the typewriter behind you, and she asks the question of what were the biggest challenges in publishing your books. My books in general, I mean, uh, you know, getting a book published is, is no easy task, right? So, in it, but it's something that I always wanted to do. Uh, and I'm lucky enough that, I, you know, I kept having books published and not every book is going to be successful, but you still have that anxiety on the day of publication of, you know, hoping the book reaches an audience and connects with people. Um, there was a lot more anxiety when it came to writing my own story. One, I had the anxiety of um, people not accepting it for me because I'm, I'm known for younger fare. Uh, I wasn't worried about my family though, because I had them all read uh, drafts of the book well before the book was ever published. I knew publication day was not the first day that family members would, should be able to read it. I had a very open and honest conversation because I didn't want my writing this book to negatively affect the relationships that I had. Of course, I, I, you know, I hope the book would, would be successful because this was my one and only chance to write about my life in such a way. Um, and like anything, you know, I, having spent so much time on, on social media too, like just uh, hoping that it was uh, well received. Right. And not because it's so personal. Like there's, there's one thing about, you know, receiving criticism uh, for a work of fiction, but then putting something out there when it's not in your control uh, and it's so personal and how people might react to that. So that, that, that created a lot of anxiety for sure. And I know you said that you, the members of your family had a chance to read it beforehand uh, and you were worried about some of their reaction. I know your, your grandparents had passed away by the time you were working on the book, but what were some of the reactions from the people close to you about this? I mean, story? they said it, that it was spot on. I mean, that the only corrections that some people had were about some of the details of my grandfather's factory that I, I wouldn't have really known. Uh, but in regards to the events and the emotions and how people behaved, it was spot on. And, you know, certainly, have that also anxiety of like, I wonder what my grandparents would have thought about that because, because of their generation, they were very private people who didn't believe in things like going to therapy or talking about your problems. But my, my grandmother's best friend, her name is Peggy. And I go to visit her every summer. She's 94 now. Uh, she did read it and she loved it. And she, she said, your grandmother would have loved this book. That's exactly how she was. It's like, I was visiting my old friend again. Uh, so that, that was very reassuring. Uh, one, you know, one of my favorite authors who writes about their own life is David Sedaris. And I went to see him speak uh, while I was writing the book. And I was able to ask a question during the Q&A portion of the event. And I asked him what his what his family thought about the books. And he said, well, he didn't give away any of their secrets. And if you've ever read David Sedaris 
book, you're, then you probably are leading to wonder like, well, what in the heck are their secrets? Uh, but, you know, that was a very important lesson for me to understand. Like there, there's, a, there's my story. There's my story that overlaps with family members. And then there's stories that belong to them. Uh, and so really the only thing I got deeply personal in a story that didn't belong to me was my, my aunt, who's like a sister when she was a, a pregnant teen and moving out of the house with a baby. And that was something that I got her blessing for before I included it in the story. We always have questions from students. So I'll ask it now uh, a question about what would you be if you weren't uh, a graphic novelist or if you weren't a writer? What other career paths were you thinking about and, and what, what career paths might you still be thinking about? I, I've always loved teaching. I've always loved performing. I've always loved video work. And I'm lucky enough that I'm able to do all of that through my work as an author, you know, like the, the writing and illustrating is, is the main part of what I do. Uh, but, you know, typically be pandemic aside, I travel the country and I give presentations. When the pandemic hit, I was able to use all of the skills I have about video production to set up these lights and cameras in such a way and created content for YouTube. And now I'm creating content for TikTok. And I'm, and I really love both of those platforms. With YouTube, uh, I'm able to give more in-depth tutorials on writing and illustrating. With TikTok, I'm able to almost like, the thing about TikTok is you're constantly introducing yourself to people because if you 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 get on the For You page to, to find information or find people. And so I've been having so much fun just giving little pieces of advice about cartooning. Um, so I'm, I'm teaching, I'm doing video work, I'm performing through, through all of that. Uh, and something too that I always have been trying to do is getting some sort of film or TV adaptation of one of my books. And for the past 16 years, I've had projects with some of my books have been with DreamWorks or Nickelodeon or Sony. Um, who else was I with for a bit? Um, uh, I said Universal, DreamWorks, Sony, uh, Walden Media. And, and the projects almost happened, but then they don't happen. And that's Hollywood. See, with Hollywood, the person that is least respected is the author. And in literature and publishing books, the person who is most valued is the author. Uh, and, and what I learned certainly over the years with tr having film adaptations possibly happen is that the only time you have power is right before you sign that contract. And there was interest in Hey Kiddo to be a TV series, live action. There was an offer on the table we did negotiate and I ultimately just, they said some things that were red flags for me. I, I didn't think that they were speaking about heroin addiction with much respect. Uh, and I asked them for some absolutes in some of the characters because of course these characters are and were living people. Uh, and they just didn't want to give me the, the, the smallest bit of control over who these characters would be on screen. And so I walked. Do you regret that? Not at all. No. Nope. Nope. Because it would have, uh, it would have been something I would not have been proud of. The end product. I just know. And and they were talking about actors who that would have been epic, so epic playing my grandparents. And I, of course, I have these these flights of fantasies of of like well, I could walk on a set of that would look like my childhood home. Um, before the pandemic hit, I had turned my attention to stage. We were doing uh, full unabridged readings of the book with uh, with the artwork displayed behind us on stage, eight readers. And those were just some magical, wonderful events. Uh, and then I was in talks with some theaters about adapting Hey Kiddo for stage, but all of those uh, conversations were immediately off the table once the, once the pandemic hit. But we'll get there and again someday, and perhaps it'll be an independent film. Maybe it'll be... Uh, a stage play, but when it comes to a TV series, you know, a lot will have to be made up to to have the the storyline continue, episodically. That that seems right and better to with a story that's so personal. Better to make sure that you feel really good about it if it's being translated to that other form. Yes, uh, we for have sure. a, a couple questions. A couple questions from teachers who want to know what advice would you give to students who want to be writers or who want to be illustrators or graphic novelists. You know, if this is what you want as a career, uh, you have to uh, you have to be thick skinned. You have to be a hard worker. 
because uh, you have to be a creative problem solver. You know, a big part of my income is derived from my speaking engagements, which were then all suddenly taken away from me when the pandemic hit. So I instantly pivoted to teaching comics classes online or giving Zoom webinars to schools. And I didn't expect to create a whole course where I would teach online comics. But since last summer, you know, once a week I get online and I have little classes of 20, 25 students, anywhere between, you know, elementary age kids or, or teenagers or adults. And I'm teaching them comics every week. And it was because of that quick pivoting and creative problem solving that I was able to do that. So you have to be a creative problem solver. You have to be on a constant quest to uh, improve your craft. You know, I was only ever published, you know, after getting rejected for two years, it wasn't that first story that got picked up. It wasn't the second, third or fourth story or fifth story. It was the sixth story that I wrote that a publisher eventually saw and liked. And so had I, had I stuck with that one story, it said, it's, this is it or nothing, it would have been nothing. But I was constantly trying to reassess my writing and what I was doing. Uh, and, and you just have to be persistent uh, and you have to believe in yourself, take uh, criticism, uh, take constructive criticism uh, at, to heart, take all other criticism with a grain of salt. We have a question about the difference between some of the, the younger uh, children's books that you've done and a book like Hey Kiddo. Um, and those seem to me like, you know, almost two different worlds. I guess I'd ask, do they feel like two different worlds when you're creating them, that it's a completely different mindset for the first to the second? Or is there some overlap between these two experiences? Well, the overlap is telling the story with words and pictures and having the pictures flow in such a way that they recreate the flow that your eyes travel on a page for the reading experience. The content is very, there are no curse words in my books for younger readers. And I'll tell you the first couple of times that I was writing curse words and Hey Kiddo was a little daunting until, you know, I had to realize this is just real life. And it was suddenly freeing to have any subject matter on the table and what I could write about. Uh, and so I love that I get to write uh, the sort of like magical escapist stories for kids, for little kids that are goofy and fun, and that I now get to also write these these raw, very truthful life stories for, for teens as well. It's good to hear that your grandmother's friend said that it was all that it was true to life. She really emerges with all the cuss words on on the page uh, <laughs> in Hey Kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our students want to know what, and I, I know you said that, that there's, there have been difficulties during the pandemic, like for everybody. Um, but mm -hmm. they want to know what's your typical work day. Like, uh, there's no typical work, work day. Yeah. Like even, even, even a non pandemic time, there's no typical work day. My schedule is all over the place. Uh, be it, I have an event one day and not the other day, or I'm traveling, um, and it all depends on where I am in the, in the creative process. If I'm writing, I need to have a very specific space, right? I don't, I can't have distractions. I can't have clutter. I can't have mess. Uh, I cannot listen to music unless it is, is maybe classical or jazz with, with no lyrics. But even that, even the beat of the music can interfere with my writing. Uh, and, and it's when I'm writing that I really feel like I'm that like stereotypical artist of, I need to be in the right headspace to do this. Now, when I'm creating the artwork, that's more like a factory job where I'm, I'm stamping my time card. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm pulling long hours. And it's then that I'm listening to audiobooks or podcasts or any music to, to, to engage my brain in a certain way so that my body can stay put to get all of the artwork finished. And during the pandemic, what have been some of the things that have kept you going here? I know it's been difficult creative process, but what's been what have been the things that have kept you kept you working or kept you sane through all of this? Well, I think I think connecting with people online via events like this, you know, um, I, I've essentially created a, a, a television studio <laughs> in my basement here with lights and the, and, and the microphones and the cameras. And uh, knowing 
that the content that I was putting out there on YouTube, especially in the first couple of months of the pandemic, and especially those first few weeks when schools yet had their rhythm going, I was creating a daily drawing show that so many families depended on for structure and distraction. And that gave me a great sense of purpose. Uh, so whereas creatively with words and pictures for, for publishing, I didn't get a ton done. I got a lot of video work done. And that's just kind of where my mind was. You know, we also, we're, re, um, we're relaunching the Lunch Lady books. The new books are going to be in full color. And so we're working on the colorizations of those. Uh, and I can show you, I can show you some sample pages from that. Um, and so I, I supervised the colorist that we had hired. And I'll put some pages up here to the, to the screen. Uh, and so I supervised the colorist and then, and they've got the files and then put in my own, um, nuances on some of the pieces before they went off to the printer. And I'm so amped uh, for this. And, and, and also this is, this is a book that I wrote and illustrated like 13, 14 years ago. So it was like comfort food to, to go back to this like really happy, happy world. And the new Lunch Lady books will be a little bit taller and, and, and twice the length. Um, so, so that was something that, that, that definitely, uh, brought me a lot of life this past year as well. Cool. Uh, you touch on this question a little bit in the, in Hey Kiddo, um, with the art teacher in the, in the art class that you take as a teenager. Uh, but we have a question that for folks want to know, were there any teachers or other adults who encouraged you, uh, when you were writing or illustrating? There were, and what there were was many. that encouragement like? Uh, you know, my, one of the teachers at my high school that I never had her as a, as a classroom teacher, but she moderated the school newspaper and uh, she hired me to be the cartoonist for the high school newspaper. And, and the time I spent with her working on that was profound. Uh, when I, I was rejected from my number one school of choice for, for college, I really wanted to go to Rhode Island school of design. They rejected me. I went to a different school. And when I was home on winter break, I ran into one of my English teachers from high school, Miss Guru. And she stopped me and we're chatting. And she said, whatever, whatever happened to RISD? Are you going to reapply as a transfer sophomore? And I said, you know, gosh, Miss Guru, I said, I don't know. It's in the back of my mind, but but I'm not sure. And she said, Well, if it's in the back of your mind, maybe it ought to be in the front of your mind. And then she turned around and, and walked off. And it was such a simply stated and poignant piece of advice of if it's in the back of your mind, it ought to be in the front of your mind. And, and that is something that I have sort of lived by of, if it's something I would think about trying to do, I should, I should just do it because I, I, I would, I would rather not live with regret for never trying. That's great. A teacher with just a couple words of wisdom and then she turns and, and walks off and left. Yeah. Uh, let me ask as a final question for some book recommendations. Now that wow. students uh, in our book up program have have read Hey Kiddo, uh, what's next for them? What would you suggest as as a couple books that they should really engage with? I have three graphic novels here. Let me let me get my overhead shot so you can really get a good look at them. All right, first I have Dragon Hoops by Jean Luen Yang, and and I wish that you could. If this cover, it feels like a basketball, like the production value. Uh, so this is a, this is Jean Louis Yang, who's also a National Book Award finalist. And he was a, a math teacher at a high school. And he, in this graphic memoir, he tells the story about how he himself, who is not athletic, how he took a bold step forward to learn more about the athletic program at his high school and he follows the basketball team for a year. And so not only is it a story about the friendship between the artist and the jock, but it goes into the story of these teenagers who are playing, playing basketball. And, and all throughout the book, we get some flashbacks and we get the actual, the history 
of basketball as it you know was invented nearby where I live here uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. This is a very powerful story. Dragon Hoops by Jean Luen Yang. Flamer by Mike Corrado. Uh, I was asked to blurb the book and they put it on the cover. And my blurb was this book will save lives. This is a fictional take on Mike's real life uh, being biracial and gay and, and, and coming to terms and learning about oneself while being at summer camp in the mid 1990s. Uh, like Hey Kiddo, it's black and white with some use of spot color. And it is a powerful and intense and beautiful story. It's, he's dealing with body image. He's dealing with his, his obsession with the X-Men. He's dealing with religion. He's dealing with his sexuality. He's dealing with racism and bullying. Um, it's a powerful and beautiful story. And that is Flamer by Mike Corrado. The third book that I would like to recommend is Almost American Girl by Robin Ha. Also, this is a graphic memoir. And this is about Robin, uh, about her life coming to America when she was in her very early teens. Her mother said they were visiting Huntsville, Alabama for a vacation. It turns out they are going to Huntsville, Alabama so she uh, could get married to a new man. Uh, the chapter openers also have some of Robin's high school artwork. And it is about uh, family. It is about trying to assimilate in a new culture. Uh, it's about how art saved Robin as well. Um, really beautiful and powerful story. Um, and that is Almost American Girl by Robin Ha. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, the whole setup there. We haven't had this yet in our Book Up at Home program to have the overhead camera. Uh, and so I certainly appreciate it. I know the students and teachers tuning in appreciated it. Thank you so much, Jarrett, for, for being here with us. We will well, have thank you all for one, having me. Thank you. We will have one more uh, Book Up at Home session this, this year, this school year, uh, with author pa Pablo Cartaya will be joining us to, uh, to talk with us, to talk about his book, uh, Each Tiny Spark, on May 19th. So tune in on May 19th for our final book up session of the year. Thank you. Have a good day.